I'm Dan Bowles and this is the fifth video lecture in a series to teach the principles of our physical existence as described in my book Are We Just Bubbles? An Alternate View of Existence. In the last two lectures we discussed the actions of gravity and inertia on matter with mass and how these actions are caused by an imbalance in the vacuum space pressure which applies a net force to them. Trying to understand the behavior of vacuum space bubbles upon charged objects such that they produce electric and magnetic forces seems to be an ominous task to me. Like gravity and inertia, electric and magnetic forces are connected, but they have a more complicated dynamic connection in which one force can produce the other in an orthogonal plane with a movement of charges in vacuum space. We will look at static electricity first, which are non-moving charges, and how charged objects can exert forces on each other through vacuum space. Here are some things that we already know about electricity and what has been discussed in previous lectures. 1. There are two types of charges, positive and negative. 2. We know that charges come in discrete quantities and are confined, confined to matter, objects which also have the property of mass. We know that unlike charged bodies, positively and negatively charged bodies exhibit an attractive force between them, and that like charged bodies positively and positively, or negatively and negatively charged bodies, exhibit a repulsive force between them. We know that the electrical forces between charged objects can be transferred through vacuum space bubbles, and that the forces are transferred at the speed of light. From previous lectures, we know that the only forces that can be transferred through vacuum space to objects of matter is caused by an imbalance in their expansion and that the vacuum space bubbles remain stationary relative to the universe while expanding. We know that a charged body with mass, such as a proton or an electron, can move through the stationary vacuum space medium or remain stationary relative to it and simultaneously exhibit properties of mass and properties of charged objects. In a static situation in which the charged objects are not moving, the amount of charge an object has with respect to the electrical forces is equivalent to the amount of mass an object has with respect to the gravitational forces. That is, the greater the amount of charge, the greater the electrical force upon the charged objects. As a matter of fact, the formulas describing the behavior of the forces between the two objects with charge or mass is similar. We have the gravitational force, F sub G, which is equal to a gravitational constant times the product of the two masses and that quantity divided by the distance squared between them. And for the electrical forces, we have, which is represented as F sub E, we have a, a constant times the charge product of the two charges and that quantity divided by the distance squared. It is probably more than just a coincidence that these two separate forces are alike in form. I believe that is because the forces are transferred through vacuum space by the same means, through an imbalance in the vacuum space pressure acting on the objects. The vacuum space bubbles are distorted when they are around the massive objects. But the electrical distortion shape must be different from the gravitational distortion shape 
because it does not directly affect the gravity distortion. Also, the positively and negatively charged objects must have vacuum space bubble distortion shapes that are complementary if the objects are to have an attractive force imparted to the objects and for light charged objects to have repulsive forces imparted to them by the vacuum space bubbles. In lecture 3, I stated that the only solid geometric shape for vacuum space bubbles was the cube. It was the only one that met all other requirements of symmetry, congruent sides, and the like. And in lectures 3 and 4, I used a highly simplified depiction of 2D space where the vacuum space bubbles were represented as squares to demonstrate the action of gravity and inertia. But in 3D space reality, any objects of matter are much more complex in their configurations. The matter consists of many clumps of space bubbles of different sizes and shapes, which are the atoms and subatomic particles that make up the matter. A great deal of work will have to be done if we're going to fully understand how these grouped configurations of space bubbles distort the vacuum space bubbles. Objects with significant mass may contain many, many space bubbles. So the act of distorting the surrounding vacuum space bubbles must be a cumulative effect from the space bubble configurations. Rather than just shown as simple diagrams I used for the illustrations in lectures 3 and 4. But those diagrams were sufficient enough to gain a concept of how gravity and inertia work without knowing the precise details of how the distortion is done. We will need to develop the model a little further in order to show how the electromagnetic forces are applied to charge objects of matter from vacuum space bubble distortion. We will have to use a 3D space model for this. Just a reminder lest we forget this new discovery of existence. All of vacuum space consists of vacuum space bubbles, which are all cubes of uniform size, and all sides of the cubes are in intimate contact with only one other vacuum space bubble side. These cubes are all expanding from within at the speed of light into the infinite void. This is not to say that all the bubbles are expanding at the same rate. It is just that their expansion rate defines the speed of light as we see it. This expansion is invisible to us, but it is the cause of all physical existence. The volume expansion equates to the invisible energy of existence, and the linear expansion equates to the passage of time. Now here's a bit of logic to consider. Since we have assumed that the universe consists entirely of expanding space bubbles and that their expansion and interaction with each other is responsible for all observable actions in the universe, then in 3D space there are only three orthogonal dimensions or degrees of freedom in which the vacuum space bubbles can expand or be restricted. If we consider each vacuum space bubble individually, we could establish the positive space occupied by the bubble in the void with the, with the origin of an X, Y, and Z coordinate system centered on it. There would be one of these for each space bubble in the universe. Now since there is no such thing as negative universe space, all lengths on the axis are positive. And since we are talking about universe volume occupied in the void, the units of measure would have to be the unchanging Prince units that remain constant with universe expansion. So now we will say that our universe vacuum space where no objects or electromagnetic energy is present, present there exists this stationary, 
an invisible 3D matrix of perfect cubical vacuum space bubbles that are expanding proportionally at the speed of light into the infinite void of non-universe space. In areas where there are objects of mass or charged objects, fields of distorted vacuum space bubbles around the object. These fields are no more than strings of vacuum space bubbles which are distorted by restricted expansion in one or more of the XYZ dimensions. This distortion has altered the perfect cubical shape of the vacuum space bubbles and has slightly changed their expansion and surface area to volume ratio. Now, there's likely going to be confusion when we are talking about an arbitrary object expanding proportionally. So I would like to clarify that a bit and also to develop a model of proportional expansion for the cube. Remember that when we are talking about space expansion in the creative sense, we are talking about the invisible expansion of each cubical space bubble from within. And this expansion is into the void of non-universe space. Now, since the bubbles that make up our universe and make up all of our space and material, they cannot share their universe space with each other. So if they expand, they are expanding into space that never was before, and that would be the void space. We say that the bubble is expanding around the origin of its axis in absolute and unchanging length units of princes. Now princes are the name of uh, the unit of measurement I gave for the initial size of the universe when it came into existence. If the universe has physical existence, it has a size. And it had an initial size when it was first formed. That, that diameter, if you assume it's a sphere, that diameter is the length, unit measurement length that we're going to use in the void to measure universe expansion. We can't use our meters, inches, whatever, because all of those units are expanding as our universe expands. So we have to have some kind of a reference to say how much the universe has expanded. And so I set the French as a standard uh, unit that's to be used that is unchanging as the universe expands. Now, when we, most of the time when we think of expansion, we think of it in terms of a ratio. We might say that Susie has doubled her size since she was in the first grade, which would be a ratio of two. If she was 30 inches tall when she started elementary school, she would now have grown 30 more inches and would have doubled her height to 60 inches. What about her width? If she was 10 inches wide when she started, would she have now grown 30 inches in width? No. She would have grown 10 more inches and double her width to 20 inches. <clears throat> Proportional expansion means growing in all directions by a certain ratio. When we talk about linear expansion, we mean expansion in one direction only. If we look at this cubicle via vacuum space bubble model and say that it doubled its size proportionally, we mean that the cube has doubled the dimension, the size of all of its dimensions. Obviously, the length, width, and height of the cube 
would have doubled their length by the same linear amount. But if you looked across the diagonal dimension, you would find that it did not exchange, uh, did not change by the same linear amount. Instead, it is double its original diagonal length. We know that gravity and electrical forces act through space in all directions equally. It doesn't matter the orientation of the action with respect to the vacuum space bubble orientation. If an object moving through vacuum space is moving at a line or oriented diagonally to the vacuum space bubble in this direction, it would have the same effect if it was moving in a direction parallel to one of the axes. This means that the linear force of the moving object against a vacuum space bubble distorts the proportional expansion in that direction regardless of the vacuum space bubble orientation. So, how do we represent this with respect to a cube? It turns out that the only 3D object that expands the same linear amount in all directions with a proportional expansion as linear expansion is a sphere. So we will use a spherical model for the cubical vacuum space bubbles to show the proportional expansion distortion. Now, this represents the proportional expansion of the cube. It's still a cube, but it's expanding proportionally equally in all directions, and uh, so we represent it as a sphere. So now we will represent the cubical vacuum space bubbles in open vacuum space where nothing is distorting the proportional expansion as a perfect sphere. The axis orientation is arbitrary for these proportionality expansion model purposes. In my book, I've shown that 3D representation is this, where we have uh, the sphere here, the XYZ axis, it's a perfect sphere, uh, it's proportionally expanding uh, equally in all directions, and, and this is a, in the case where the vacuum space is not is not being influenced by magnetic, electric, or gravitational fields. Uh, it's expanding at what we think of as a speed of light. As I said before, it actually defines the speed of light, this expansion rate. We see it as three times in the eighth meters per second in our universe. So now, let's revisit the gravitational distortion of the vacuum space bubbles with this new 3D distortion model. Gravitational distortion of the vacuum space bubbles around an object with mass is restrictive in the radial z direction, which would be perpendicular to a plane tangent to the surface of the mass massive object. So, if we have this vacuum space bubble, this would be the z axis here. If it was up against an object with mass, this, this axis would be perpendicular to a plane that is tangent to the object surface. And the restriction flattens this uh, this uh, proportional distortion sphere that we have, have representing 
the cube. So it gets flattened. The other dimensions, if you look at this this way, it's still the same dimension like that. And it's the same height here as it was. So the only dimension that's affected is in the Z direction. It flattens the, the sphere into a, an ellipsoid. And this restriction then is what causes the reduced space pressure. All the vacuum space bubbles around an object with mass have their have their the the adjoining vacuum space bubbles have their axes proportional representation axes perpendicular to that. So you'll have all around it you will have these flattened ellipsoids that will cause the reduced vacuum space pressure around the object. It's not just the uh, immediate ones, it spreads out and diminishes as it goes away from the object. So, with that, uh, I'm going to conclude this lecture and the we have made a new model for the uh, expansion distortion that we'll use in the next lecture, which will be the electric fields and electric and magnetic forces and how the vacuum space bubbles uh, cause the forces on objects with that. Thank you for listening.